welcome back, everyone. Thank you for gathering uh, with us again on the second day. I wanted to give a very big special thank you to Rui and his team for taking on this task of hosting our, our conference, helping with the organizing, and really uh, delivering us an awesome dinner last night. So please help me thank you. They completely went above and beyond. And I also want to thank um, the rest of the organizing committees for um, helping make this a reality, which we hope will be one of future events where we, we come together. We'll talk more about that later. So um, just a, a few words about the logistics for today. We're going to have three talks. Where Cheryl Nam's talk will be the third talk today before the break. Um, at the break, we're going to do the photo outside right here on the terrace, right at the beginning of the break, before everyone scatters. So we'll do the photo then. Um, because we have this extra half hour talk, it'll push back uh, lunch a little bit, but we'll still have just over an hour for lunch, and then we'll come back for the afternoon session. Um, Rui, did you have anything else to add? Or is that... Uh, yeah, the copy of the presentation. Oh, the presentation. So we're, we're planning to post the presentations on the website. So if you uh, if you wouldn't like yours up there, if you don't want it up there, please um, notify Rudy and Carlos, and, and we will post them. Um, and they may come to you and, and, and get your presentation if it's not already on the conference. Um, great, thank you. Um, without further ado, we are going to hear about the National Water Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit of a different topic today because this is a session on operational forecasting. Right? That's it. That's it. I can fail for ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what teamwork is all about, right? <laughs> That's what you say. <laughs> um, so, uh, as some of you know, uh, the work hydro system that uh, we've talked about a little bit, uh, that you folks here have been using. Uh, a couple years ago, was selected to be one of the operational hydrologic prediction models uh, in the United States. Uh, this is an activity that was uh, led uh, in terms of logistics and planning uh, by NOAA, uh, the National Weather Service. And they went through a process looking at different models in the community and um, saw a few things, uh, features that they liked with Work Hydro. Uh, that happened in about 2014, and from then on, we've been super busy trying to adapt the model and scale it up uh, performance-wise and improve the physics and things like that to make it operate over the whole United States. And for those of you who've done sort of this large domain modeling, you can appreciate uh, how big of a challenge that is uh, to try and get good performance everywhere. Uh, so I'm going to try and go through quickly some basic descriptions of what the system looks like now and then try to get as quickly as possible to visualizations and examples and things like that. So I think that's really the best way to communicate what uh, a national water model is. So the motivation for this uh, at the high level NOAA is, done here is that NOAA provides predictive services for the nation and they're getting asked by many of their stakeholders to provide increasingly, increasingly broader range of predictive services. And so this map here, this diagram, kind of displays the different topical areas that they get involved with from a federal provision of information perspective. And also overlaying on there the sort of temporal and spatial scales that become relevant for these kinds of issues. Issues related to flooding, pollution, drought, uh, and ultimately biodiversity. And the existing forecast system that they had, which was largely a, a lump model forecasting capability that was run say on a desktop computer with a lot of manual intervention uh, to provide a forecast at a point as opposed to distributed across the landscapes, wasn't really allowing them to do a lot of these types of applications that they wanted to and provide a more uniform level of service for the whole country. And going to sort of a continuous hydrologic model, both in space and in time, uh, was certainly a feature that they wanted to do that. As I mentioned, uh, we've been on a pretty ambitious timeline. Uh, we only did initial proofing that was run for hydro at the continental scale in about 2014. So this hadn't been going on for very long. We've done a few smaller domain implementations for you know, several regions in the 
United States and other places around the world. But we hadn't really sort of bitten off the whole country uh, until we started this particular project. Uh, we were on then in 2014, we're on about a three year time frame, three to four year time frame for implementing the national water model into operations. And then there was some congressional pressure that happened in April of 2015. They said, get it done in a year, which was fun. So then you see a, a very rapid succession of activities after that, that sort of leads up to where we are now. And the model actually went operational in August of 2016. We had to be in pre-operational testing by about April, May of 2016. So we really ended up having just about a year from the time they said implement this operationally uh, and, and we got done. But it did for better or worse. And here we are and we've done now we've delivered three versions of the model version 1.0, 1.1, 1.2 uh, since the first task was put on the table and a lot of these more recent versions have been addressed as making some physics upgrades, dealing with issues of calibration, uh, improving some of the foundational geospatial data sets that go into the model, uh, and working uh, a lot more on some of the data simulation that's going into the model. So as we've talked about and we've seen presentations before, there's a core set of physics components that we all sort of refer to as Warp Hydro. We've got the problem land surface model, we've got the terrain routing, channel and reservoir, routing modules, but a physics model does not an operational system make, and I think everybody who's done operational systems and then understands that. There's so many more things that have to happen to create an, an, an forecasting system, right? So for the national water model, like many hydrologic models, you have to have ways to really process and, and specify your forcing data that are going to go into that. There's a lot of underlying geospatial data that has to be processed. Uh, this includes terrain, land cover, soils, hydrography, lake objects, uh, channel properties, uh, things like that, subsurface structure data. All of these sort of feed back into the model. There's the data assimilation system that uh, becomes an essential part of the forecasting system. For the national water model, we're not yet using DART, that's sort of one of our research activities, but we're using uh, basic stream flow nudging methodology to ingest real-time stream flow data. Um, we had to build a, an entire model evaluation and calibration tool set, and a lot of that was Aubrey's brainchild, who's over there working in the corner. So she was really leading uh, a lot of the effort right here to help build ways to evaluate the model in a, in a very holistic way. Um, we had to deal with a lot of issues that came with requirements of the National Water Model and running on a specific kind of river network, a vectorized network, whereas before we had only done a little bit of that, we had done more grid cell based routing in the model, so we had to deal with a lot of different catchment, sort of multi-spatial uh, framework ad adaptations for moving between catchment channels and grids. And then finally, um, when the model went into pre-operations and really into operations, very limited capacity on the NOAA side to actually visualize the model so that the data was available. You could download the data from the website, the FTP site for MINSEP, but there's really no way to visualize it. So as part of this, we built an entire uh, web mapping service so that we, sort of as the development team, could actually see what the model was doing in real time and, and really have it for a basis of diagnosis and then providing feedback to NOAA on how the model was performing. So that's sort of the ecosystem of tools that got built. The key thing that we've touched on in a few of these Warp Hydro talks is this sort of multi-spatial framework capability. And this slide illustrates that in another way. And it gives you a feel for what the resolution of the model is. So the, yellow, the solid yellow lines here and these dotted yellow lines represent the two different grid structures that we were using. Um, and then underneath that, is of course a satellite image. This happens to be the city of Springfield, Missouri, and then the river channel network. So this river channel network was defined by the USGS for the entire nation. Uh, there's about 2.7 million river reaches uh, where flow is being routed. The two different grid meshes that are overlaying here, the solid lines represent the one kilometer spatial resolution column land surface model. And then the dotted boxes are a 250 meter routing grid. So those 
two grids are interacting with each other and provide uh, spatial coverage for the entire model domain. And then there's a set of these uh, catchment mapping operations, which map certain runoff terms onto catchments, which are associated with every one of these river reaches. So that gives you an idea. We're dealing with about three to four different spatial frameworks. So one grid at one kilometer, one grid at 250 meters, one catchment uh, object framework, one vectorized river network framework, and there's also a lake object framework that's tied into the, to the stream channel network. So there's a lot of information sort of being passed around here just for scale. You can see that's about 18 kilometers. So you get an idea of what the, the resolution of the model is. Another uh, aspect of the water model that some folks don't always, um, I guess, uh, wrap their head around is that there's multiple configurations that are in operations right now, and there's, there's some reasons for that. Of course, you have to have an analysis which brings the model up to real time. This is where our assimilation is also happening. That cycles hourly, uh, driven largely by radar data, radar precipitation data, and other background meteorological variables for the country. Then we have a short range forecast, which is driven by a high resolution NWP model. In this case, it's the high resolution rapid refresh or HER model, which has a three kilometer spatial resolution for the country. And then for longer time ranges, we use a, a GFS model. Many folks here have been using the GFS model for various parts of their research. And that we're running out to 10 days. So we're not running the full duration of the GFS cycle. That cycles four times per day. So you get four different deterministic forecasts from those every day. And then there's a long range configuration, which has got a little bit of it, it's a little bit of a different animal. It is the only true ensemble of the national water model that's run, meaning there's multiple executions or cycles of the model for each cycle. Uh, four, it's four members four times a day, so it's not a lot. It runs out to 30 days and it uses downscale and bias corrected climate forecast systems. It also is a little bit more simplistic than the other configurations in that in this long range configuration, we're not using those high resolution routing functions, all right? We're using the one dimensional column model and we're going straight to catchment aggregation uh, from those. And the reason is, is those routing functions are very computationally intensive compared to some of the other parts of the model. And so this allows us to do this uh, 16 member ensemble, 16 members is daily. Uh, the daily ensemble side. So those are the different uh, configurations um, that, that we have of the model. One thing I will say is, you know, as we've seen uh, both in this conference and have seen a lot of the national water model output, um, it's essential to be sampling some of the uncertainty associated with these meteorological forecasts. Well, each of these forecasts for the short and medium range are deterministic runs, but what we're trying to do is basically <coughs> the sort of rapid frequency of updates of several of these products to create some time lag ensemble. So I'll show an example of that for Hurricane Harvey, how that really adds a lot of value. I think what Fierce presented yesterday really demonstrates the need to be moving towards uh, more ensemble-based methodologies. Some of the technical specs of the model, um, we ingest about four and a half terabytes of data a day. It outputs about three terabytes of data a day. So there's more metadata uh, that's sourced to go into the model and comes out of the model, um, but it's still kind of a lot of data to manage. It certainly challenges some of the infrastructure at the existing river forecast centers who aren't used to dealing with this volume of data, like the way that weather offices are often used to deal with the data. Um, as I mentioned, there's about 2.7 million river reaches. We're up to, oh, what is it, 1,506 reservoirs with version 1.2 of the model. Um, large number of computational elements, about 360 million computational elements in the model, it's about 75,000 lines of code. And we burn about 100,000 CPU hours a day. So it's a pretty significant change from the existing lumped hydrologic model, which is running uh, on a desktop computer river forecast center. But this is really not that heavy of a lift computationally compared to most of the meteorological models that we run these days. So we're talking about sort of a mid size. Uh, modeling system here. Um, just to provide a few examples, one of the biggest innovations we did between version 1.1 and 1.2 was with some of the geospatial data. And uh, one of the challenges we had early on was that there was a disconnect between the definition of this NHD 
vectorized network of rivers and the underlying digital elevation model, which we had to reprocess to 250 meters. And that created some inconsistencies and in things like the inundation uh, product that was coming out of the model. So in version 1.2, there was a lot of work that went in to harmonize this vectorized network with the 250 meter terrain model. And as we'll see, this sort of allows uh, the model to better handle many of the overland flow processes in a, in a more physically realistic way in terms of moving those towards river valleys and ultimately stream channels. Uh, another uh, improvement that was made was actually made to the core NOAA MP land surface model. So NOAA MP is a land surface model it's also used in a lot of weather prediction as well. It's part of the WARF model suite. Uh, and it's, my, it's now in a process of migrating into several different operational meteorological models at ENSA. Uh, what we found from the water model is that it has some instabilities in the representation of infiltration in sandy soils. And this is a good example from Hurricane Matthew of 2016, where the hurricane came through uh, the northern part of Florida, up the eastern seaboard. And within a day or so, several of these pocket areas <coughs> had had very rapid dry down of the soil. And it was basically uh, a numerical instability in rapidly infiltrating and propagating soils that caused that. And the water model, uh, because it's used, it's looked at in a much more rigorous hydrologic sense by hydrologic forecasters and other people in the community who are using it to make products. Notice these are in facts and actually reported facts. So we made some updates to that on the version 1.1. 1 .1. And so I've been able to to resolve that issue uh, through some modifications to the numerical scheme for soil moisture. Uh, snowpack was another area where we had some very significant deficiencies in the model. Uh, in the initial version that went in, we partnered with people from NASA and utilized some airborne LIDAR data and looked at snowpack across some high altitude catchments in the western United States. And uh, high resolution LIDAR can give you depictions of snow depth at this sort of centimeter scale. And so we were able to aggregate that back up to the resolution of the model to see where we had these deficiencies. And again, this is part of Aubrey's work with uh, Mike Barlot from the group and diagnosed essentially an erroneous uh, surface resistance formulation in open areas above tree line, which was resulting in a very rapid ablation of snowpack in the stream flow in the springtime. And so uh, we were able to go in and make that change. And this diagram here is sort of the change in error between the model versions as compared with uh, the baseline NASA airborne LIDAR data set. And basically, where you see all these red colors that say our air has been reduced by X many millimeters of snow water equivalent, which in this case are a couple hundred millimeters, so that's quite a bit of snowpack that's remaining and back up in the watershed, and it's a significant error reduction. So through the water model effort, it's one thing to take it and implement it in operations. We're now getting to that point. We're starting to get feedback on its performance that are propagating back into some of the component models that create the work hydro system, but are also used in these other disciplines as well. OK, so a little bit more on some of these components, and then I'll show a few more examples. The model evaluation package that is being used is, uh, a, is a new suite of software that was built entirely in R. Uh, which is open source, and so you can go on to GitHub right here and pull down uh, a fairly extensive set of tools that helps you ingest uh, different data sets, national water model data, regular work hydro data, uh, and then a number of different variables that you can look at uh, for evaluation. So we've uh, developed tools to look at precipitation, temperature, uh, the rest of the meteorological field, snowpack, soil moisture, I guess, point soil moisture measurements, gridded soil moisture products, uh, some of the energy components of the model, evapotranspiration, skin temperature, albedo, uh, and of course, a lot of emphasis in these tools is on doing different kinds of stream flow analysis. So that's being used now in a number of different ways to evaluate the model, but also to provide the backbone of a calibration system. So calibrating a model at the continental scale is clearly a challenge, and it's something that can't be done manually and so uh, an entire automated calibration framework had to be set up to do this. Uh, and not just one base at a time, we had to be able to batch large numbers of watersheds. So uh, we adapted these R tools, uh, and put a Python wrapper around it, uh, and interfaced it with a database to sort of handle the management of all the statistics that are coming out of this. And then run these through an optimization algorithm, which is this dynamically dimensioned search algorithm. 
And so we track in this calibration activity uh, somewhere around a dozen different stream flow prediction metrics. And then we optimize on one of those right now. So we're not yet doing multi-criteria uh, calibration and optimization, uh, but we can track the performance of multiple ones as we go through the calibration process. So this is all being sort of wrapped up and cleaned up now for the next release of the code back to the community. Uh, our work hydro is already available to the community. Uh, but really what this allowed us is to see some pretty significant improvements in the model just due to calibration uh, and some of those physics changes I mentioned from versions 1.0 to 1.1 and 1.2. This is a map of bias and uh, essentially this is uh, from a retrospective five-year simulation of the model for version 1.2. The color scale is such that you want your points to be yellow, which is basically a zero bias. The reds are a dry bias and the blues are a dark bias or a heavy bias. You see in the Western United States, the model does tend to have a bit of a high bias. And a lot of that's because we don't represent diversions and withdrawals from the hydrologic system in the West. Throughout most of the East, we tend to be pretty good uh, with a, a slight uh, dry bias uh, in many areas. And uh, we're looking at different reasons for that. These big outliers here are basically places where uh, there's such significant management that it sort of blows up the model. We don't really model the Great Lakes, so getting the flow on the on uh, one of the rivers that connects the Great Lakes is a problem. We don't do diversions out of the Mississippi River for the I'm gonna, Appalachian Chaya, Atchafalaya, <laughs> right? Uh, and that, so these things stick out like sore thumbs. But we now track all these, and what we've been able to see is from version 1.0 to 1.1 and 1.2, the distribution of our bias has become more and more yellowy and light, uh, or at least centered around um, the, the middle bend or the zero bias bend, where we're reducing some of these strong outliers on the positive tail. You can look at that with respect to correlation as well, and just to show that you know over these versions, we've been pushing things over towards the higher correlation values, uh, over towards uh, the, the one value. And you can see the distribution of those. We're using USGS gauge data here, about 8,000 stations to track model performance uh, at any one time. And we're working with uh, NOAA and the Water Center to try and update the number of stations that uh, are used. And you can see there's some really significant gaps around the country. Mm -hmm. And that really does impact our ability to be able to perform rigorous evaluations in a lot of these areas. And this area of the high plains is one of our most challenging areas to work in terms of providing skill and diagnosing exactly what the problems are. I mentioned earlier that uh, a essentially a whole visualization tool package had to be built for this. So we built uh, this web mapping service, which pulls in uh, real-time retrospective uh, water model output, overlays it in sort of a Google Maps type of interface. We don't use Google, but it looks it kind of feels like that. And so there's a number of different options here for planning geographic spatial data layers as well as the grid model outputs and the, and the point or vectorized model outputs. We've adapted that once to provide a whole uh, verification desktop capability so the forecasters who are starting to look at this data in a lot more detail can go in and get background forecast verification statistics for all the, the locations that we have data for. And so now I'm going to just show some of the examples of this. This was one of the sort of the first uh, national scale animations that came out of the model. This is a continuous simulation. This is not a forecast uh, that was spinned up. It was part of our retrospective runs for the first version of the model, covering about three months in 2015. Uh, you're going to see some heavy flooding. There goes Houston in 2015, because it flooded in 2015. Too. Another one. Was that? Another one. It's flooded three out of the last three years, oh, about 100%. Gosh. And all of those events have been more than 100 years. So yeah, Houston has uh, some lessons to build on. Um, but you can see this was sort of one of the first times, at least in the US, that there had been this sort of nationally integrated depiction of hydrology uh, and stream flow. And you can see multiple scales of activities going on, the very fast, rapidly moving things are summertime thunderstorms and some frontal systems moving across the country, impacting headwaters. And then in the big rivers, you can see flood waves sort of more slowly moving down, propagating down the stream. Uh, this is just uh, from last winter, a national analysis of snowpack conditions that came out of the model, uh, zooming in on the western United States. 
Uh, Vincent, you'll see we've got that nice artifact there going into Canada because we switched forcing data sets at that point. And, yeah, it's Canada, what, I mean, we don't care about that, right? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, there are some boundary effects uh, going into the, into the model. You'll see these, if you look at the model, those boundary effects can be due to changes in meteorological data, changes in soils data as you go across <coughs> the international borders, changes in some of the uh, land cover and vegetation data. Uh, so there are a few uh, unrealistic physical artifacts still remaining uh, in the model, but by and large, um, you know, this, this we've done a lot of analysis on these snowpack products where we're tracking that. Uh, example of some stream flow from an atmospheric river event last winter in California. This was one of the early ones in January. Uh, and basically, this is sort of the, the time lagged ensemble for the Merced River above Fresno. And you can see these rivers were coming out of a very low state. You're looking at about forecast with a six to seven day lead time here when uh, these earliest forecasts didn't really pick anything up. And then all of a sudden, they all started queuing in on this atmospheric river event as represented by the GFS model. The model ended up being a little bit steep or high in its peak flow, a little bit early in this forecast cycle. And that was pretty consistent with what we saw from the GFS forcing that it tended to move these storms on uh, a little too fast and with a little bit too heavy rainfall uh, for these California events. But I'm not trying to say it's just the weather model's fault. We still have some room for improvements in the hydrological model as well. Uh, another product that comes out of this is the depiction of the depth to essentially that shallow water table or saturation in the model. And this is the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. You see these yellow colors and all these river valleys. That's fully saturated <coughs> soils that have built up over the winter time. And then these blue blotches were really interesting to us. It's kind of like, well, why is that so blotchy up in the mountains? And it's, well, that's where the melting snow <coughs> was. So we we're capturing some of this really shallow soil saturation that was building up in the model due to the melting snowpack in those areas and this is from late May. Uh, so again some integrated dynamics of the model uh, a bit more on the qualitative side but uh, looking at sort of the timing of melt melt out its relationship to some of the soil hydrology. Another interesting product that comes out of the model uh, is shown here this is the Grand Canyon and you can see there's a lot of different side tributaries here there's really only water full time in the main stem of the Colorado River. And if you can barely see there, there's a lot of faint blue lines and then some yellow and red right here. And you can get a good idea of how, at least the USGS was mapping these river channels. And some of them make sense and some of them don't. But the color coding on the channel network here is the river velocity that actually comes out of the model. So um, this is something we haven't been able to validate. So there's a lot of error and uncertainty associated with it. But it's also an interesting field to look at in terms of some of the potential applications of things like river velocity for environmental studies or for recreational applications and things like that. Um, another application we've been working on is providing particle flow tracing in the model as a post-process. There was a mine spill uh, last year, two years ago, in this area of southwestern Colorado, and we were able to sort of drop a point in the model and then trace that downstream to see where that water was going to go, uh, just based on national water model output. So this is another uh, sort of environmental support service that uh, we've been using as a, as a byproduct that comes out of the model. Now, this is very simplistic. There's no dispersion, there's no reactive chemistry, there's no settling that's going on in this, so it's a completely conservative tracer. Uh, but you can see it provides a, an estimate of the relative time and sort of flow path of, of what is going to be impacted by this mine spill. And in this particular simulation, uh, the model tended to be about a day and a half early in, in bringing flow down to this end down here compared to what was uh, actually observed for that event. Okay, uh, how much time do I have? A couple minutes? Um, yeah, okay. five minutes. Five minutes, oh, perfect. So let me wrap up then by talking about, um, of course, what we spent a lot of time with the last few weeks, which is dealing with hurricanes, Harvey and Irma. Um, and so we were pulled into providing support for Hurricane Harvey uh, in a number of different ways, uh, working with the Texas Department of Emergency Management and FEMA, uh, as well as within some of the traditional NOAA <coughs> pathways of information. And so uh, we learned a lot from these events, and I think it's just interesting to look at. Everyone here, I think, is well aware of how significant Harvey was. Uh, massive amounts of uh, rainfall occurred in a few days. Uh, focus on this graphic here. This is basically saying that point that somebody else brought up already that it was so much rain that they had to change the color scale uh, for NOAA. 
But, uh, you know, in some of these areas, there was over 50 inches of rain in uh, about three and a half to four days. That's over a thousand millimeters of rain in that period of time, which was really uh, unprecedented uh, in a lot of ways. And so the question, of course, was, well, were we able to forecast this? And I would say in many ways, yeah, it wasn't a terrible forecast, depending on how you looked at it. And the big issue was, well, how much more lead time could have been given? The West Gulf River <laughs> Forecast Center has jurisdiction over that area, and they provide forecasts at these points through Texas. And those points are largely on major river systems coming from their lump model. And uh, one of the issues was that, I think Ferris even mentioned this yesterday in his talk, is that they really don't do a lot of long lead forecasting, multi-day forecasting, a lot of the river forecast centers. And in fact, the West Gulf River Forecast Center doesn't really use quantitative precipitation forecasts at all, coming from the NWP models, and their forecasts are really only issued in 24 hours in advance. So I think in the Northeast, they were using multiple days, in Texas, it's even less. Because their typical problem is more of a flash flooding type problem in that area. And they don't feel that the weather models had sufficient skill. So we got drafted into this about four or five days in advance of the event by a direct request from the Texas Department of Emergency Management because they knew that the National Water Model existed and then provided longer lead forecasts. Uh, and so we started working with them. And I'm gonna go through some of the some of the products that were developed by NOAA, the National Water Center. And, also by us uh, to help support that activity because we saw Hurricane Harvey appear in the forecast as soon as it was in the GFS track forecast and that was as early as nine days in advance of landfall. Now there's of course a lot of uncertainty nine days in advance and the tracks were shifting around a lot but mm -hmm. as just as Vera showed yesterday as you got closer and closer to the event you saw convergence in the meteorological forecast you saw convergence in hydrologic forecasts and uh, we're able to provide more confidence on our forecast with so this is a product that's created by the National Water Center. Basically, it's uh, they've got an estimate of how much water you need to exceed the river, a, a, a feature called bankful. Um, and so this is the, basically a forecast product from a given forecast cycle that says, in that cycle, what is your time to exceed your bankful state, basically to go into flood stage? And now we can map this onto those 2.7 million river reaches from the country and color code that to give a depiction of when we think these most significant flooding activities are gonna happen. And for this particular cycle of the model, it's just one cycle, uh, this was providing one to two days uh, advance notice of when those rivers would be uh, coming out of their uh, streams. And then you can sort of jump over to some of these other areas, uh, furthermore in Eastern Texas and over in Louisiana, based on this forecast to say, oh, the list is providing guidance out even farther, seven to 10 days. And in fact, we saw that this area in Eastern Texas on the Trinity and the Sabine rivers that flowed through Beaumont, which was uh, uh, heavily destroyed in the event. Uh, there was a much longer lead time available. Uh, another type of product, this is um, essentially uh, the peak flow amounts as it's color coded with all these different, um, different uh, scales of stream flow here. These are peak stream flow amounts that are pulled out of each of the forecasts. You can start to take the whole forecast and say, what's the peak flow on all these river reaches and come up with a composite map that looks like that. And then of course the users can say, well, how does that compare with some of my past flooding events or flood thresholds as well? Uh, this particular one here is an animation. This is again, looking at uh, just the, the stream flow amount as it's exceeding these different flood threshold levels. Basically, this is, if you get into these pink colors, it's a major category versus a action, a minor and moderate category, typical flood thresholds for the weather service. This is an actual forecast several days in advance, and this is what the analysis cycle of the model produced over the same time period. So we're kind of validating the model analysis back versus the forecast that came out. And you can see by and large from a, a regional perspective and magnitude perspective that uh, those forecasts are actually agree pretty well with what ended up happening. Uh, a lot of work's being done on sort of looking at where specific storm reports, flood reports, and flood watches and warnings were created and overlapping that where the water model said it was going to be different kinds of uh, severity of events. And really the point of this is to look at where these different features agree. I'm not going to go into what every little marker is here and say that 
you know, as early as eight day lead time for one given forecast cycle and seven day lead time for another given forecast cycle. You can see how these ended up validating with what was actually forecasted in terms of the flood warning. The flood warning, you know, shows you that or tells you that the flood's already basically in progress. So then I want to uh, wrap up here with two more things. Uh, one is just an example of doing these time lagged ensembles. So as we mentioned, there was a lot of forecast uh, cycle to cycle variability associated with this, uh, with these forecasts. This is a particular river. I think this is the Brazos River, uh, just to the to the west of, of Houston. And uh, so these are certainly uh, create some difficulty for uh, users of this information. But you can see that all of these forecasts were certainly <laughs> going above the major flood stage, and that many of these forecasts were up to eight to nine days in advance. And so the heads up of this significant level of event was coming with that kind of lead time was really one of the main things that came out of, of the water model. Uh, thinning that down, this is a five-day lead time model run here in this light green line here. And then the one-day lead time model run, uh, which is in that dotted line, and then the observed is that yellow line. Uh, you can start to see how those forecasts settle down. But again, clearly all above major flood stage and giving uh, the folks in the area the advance notice uh, that they did. Oh, that's the West Fork of the San Jacinto. Taking that information then and creating time lagged ensembles, uh, again, is another activity that really spun up out of this. And you can see for a couple of these rivers, it really helped moderate a lot of those individual flood events, both high and low. For the Neches River, which uh, does flow over towards uh, Beaumont, Texas, this ended up actually, the ensemble is actually quite good in that area, a little bit high, but well phased with the actual flooding. There was a lot of problems with the gauge data, as you can see here, a lot of step function changes as the USGS was going out and changing rating curves or there was interruptions with data flow. Uh, the Brazos River, uh, we did have a bit of a high bias coming in in the water model, so that's under investigation. Uh, but still, you can see that the overall timing of the time lag ensemble is pretty good. These are all well above major flood stage uh, activities. I think. In this particular case, the ensemble average did put the model above record stage, whereas in reality, um, at least according to this observation, you can see that looks like has some, some funky uh, behavior associated with it as well, um, that uh, it wasn't quite at the record stage for that particular river. Uh, this is just another example of taking data out of the model to actually an ungaged location. This is where a nursery home got flooded and had to be evacuated quickly. The nearest river, which was responsible for this flooding, uh, actually in the real-time analysis and in a short-range forecast showed that this river was going to undergo very significant rise in that area and actually exceeded uh, what is thought to be the flood stage for that river. So doing work in ungaged areas is obviously very tricky. It's hard to validate quantitatively, which a lot of times you can validate things anecdotally by the impacts that happen. Okay, and so the last thing that happened in this, of course, was inundation, you know, and that was a big story in Houston was the inundation. So during the event, folks were pulling a lot of the information out of the water model, creating different kinds of inundation products. This one here is two different examples of inundation maps where they took stream flow out of the national water model and then used a method called hand or height above normalized datum to map that river level onto a high resolution DEM. So this is not a true dynamic hydraulic space method such as in the HECRAS systems, but basically taking that flood stage and mapping it onto uh, high resolution topography. This is from one specific forecast cycle, and this is sort of the overall storm maximum inundation map from all of these different regions and different areas uh, throughout this area. These are two different domains, so don't try and do a spatial correspondence with those. Uh, but these are just two of the different products that have been developed, and now these are being analyzed, again, uh, categorically, like we saw in some of the earlier talks. There's a native, uh, essentially, surface overland flow depth product, which comes out of the model. It's often called ponded water, and so we were able to create different composites of these in real time to see where water was piling up. Uh, at 250-meter grid scale, it's, it's, not, uh, you know, it's not a direct one-to-one -one comparison to what you find on the ground, so it's more of a a relative or reference estimate of where we think water will be potting up on the surface, regardless of whether it's coming from a river channel or not. So they, those inundation maps are strictly due to overbank flow in the river? This one is just due to overbank flow um, because it's tied directly to stream flow. 
This one is basically just due to the local surface infiltration excess and movement of water on the surface as it's going towards the stream. So there, they are different kinds of products in that way. This one actually doesn't have the overbank flow associated with it, but you can now overlay these and create a combined surface map. What we saw in Houston, and they saw in places at Irma too, was that there was a lot of flooding that happened off channel. If, if it's terrain, it's going to flood in many places, whether or not there's a river channel there. Um, another thing we've been doing is uh, so-called hyper-resolution modeling, uh, in instances of the national water model in a slightly different configuration. So that's what these animations are. This is a 30-meter implementation of the model over that forecast period uh, over the Houston area. And you can see during the heaviest rainfall periods, the flooding is very dispersed across the landscape because it's this combination of local flood generation mechanisms as well as on-channel processes. And then as the rains move on, the floodwaters do tend to contract back into the overbank flow problem as the water across the landscape settles out or infiltrates or finally just makes its way to the river channel network. But this is a dynamic in terms of flood representation that's been reported a lot by emergency managers. Why is it flooding over here? There's no river. Um, but hasn't really made it into a lot of the traditional hydraulic based methods of doing flood inundation because they are usually tied to river channel networks. And these you know, sort of hyper-resolution models are, are striving to do that. Um, there's a couple of different products we're trying to analyze this with. Uh, that hand methodology for a snapshot in time here is this. This is a synthetic aperture radar overflight data that happened during that area. At that same time, so those right there are two, two instances estimates of flooding uh, from two different products, uh, which have a lot of uncertainty. Here's actually the snapshot in time from that animation from that hyper resolution instance of the model. <laughs> and, you know, I think this, this actually has a lot of, to me, physical plausibility with it. So it's going to be very interesting to see how all of these start to compare with each other. What truth was in doing flood uh, inundation work, as Vera said, is really difficult now. When you say hyper resolution, what kind of resolution? Here we're usually talking about things under 100 meters. There's a more formal definition that was written up in a paper that Eric Wood wrote uh, five or six years ago on hyper-resolution modeling, trying to basically do process representation hydrology below around one kilometer. But that's sort of written from the perspective of a land surface macro scale hydrologist. I think the engineering the hydraulics hydrologist will say, if you're going to talk about high resolution modeling, you're talking about tens of meters. And so that's that's what we've been targeting with this particular instance. You really need that to resolve the, the terrain features and some of the infrastructure features that are going to control where water goes. Um, so there's a number of different things we learned. The water model uh, was able to provide really 24-7 guidance on the impacts from the hurricane. And it updated regularly and automatically due to all these different changing track forecasts. You know, there was at least up to five days of, I think, reasonable skill in terms of the ensemble average forecast that came out of this, and even up to nine days in terms of initial heads up of the relative severity of some events. And that was really, I think, transformative compared to the way that the existing forecasts were being done at the River Forecast Center, and basically only going about 24 to 36 hours in advance. Uh, and of course, the, the National Water Model Club provided stream flow and inundation uh, estimates, guidance, I wouldn't call it completely accurate, but I would call it guidance uh, everywhere, not just at the predefined lumps forecast points uh, that the River Forecast Center was doing. Certainly, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of cycle to cycle variability. There's biases coming in the precipitation. We had a lot of issues in looking at flows in some of the bayous and wetland areas where water is stagnated, but they're not, those bayous aren't well resolved in the 250 meter DEM. Um, there's some strong surface water groundwater interactions that was talked about yesterday uh, in the talk from South Carolina. We saw some of that stuff happening in Texas as well. So there's a lot of work that needs to be uh, worked on there. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of opportunities now to look at change in the calibration because now we have a new end member to work through our calibration. Uh, this, this event, in many ways, was beyond the calibration range of all these models in this area. So not, no, very few these river systems had experienced that kind of flooding before. Just one snapshot on Hurricane Irma uh, is basically all I'll say. This is uh, Irma moved through, and we know that most of the most significant inland flooding that happened was in some of these coastal and inland areas here in South Florida, and 
and then up the east coast of Florida as you got in towards Jacksonville and into Savannah, there was actually some inland flooding which compounded with some of the coastal flooding and folks have talked about that kind of process here at this workshop. This is just an example of a microwave image flood inundation map that's produced by folks at George Mason. This comes from a combination of Go 16 and the Beers uh, satellite imager. Uh, and we compared that with what uh, the analysis area was from the National Water Model at that same point in time. And you see some interesting artifacts here, the DEM, but the overall spatial pattern, even some of these more isolated areas moving out of what becomes the Everglades down here, uh, tended to be picked up in a relative sense. Not in an exact sense, definitely not the hydraulic scale, but from a regional forecasting guidance, uh, having this available to say these kinds of inundation in, from inland flooding now, are also possible with this effect. Okay, so abrupt end, but I think that's it. Uh, hopefully that gives everybody a description of what the National Water Model is doing and how um, it was used in some of these more recent history events. Any questions? Let me handle those in sequence. Um, the, the calibration tool and our work by our work is available now. The calibration tool we're trying to release with our next release in three weeks' time. Um, so we're going to have version five and a lot of the supporting tools come out in three weeks' time. And as we talked about here, we're trying to release things in a, in a more lightweight sense for, for some of our users in Dockerized containers of the software. Uh, so folks can drop those much easier onto on uh, their systems. So we think we can we can do that um, when we're working on wrapping up uh, the Python code and the R work Python code into that Docker instance so folks may be able to do that. So I think Aubrey check me if I'm wrong or that's on track. Logan's working on that. Um, Hydro Inspector no is not a publicly available tool. That's something that we built. It's got a lot of background infrastructure in it, which you know is it does all use open source software which is good, but it's taken a lot of engineering to get to that point where you can't really, uh, we don't have a project to support that to the community, unlike the modeling tool. So our main mission is to support the model for the academic community and then for NOAA. And the visualization tool says something we had to build on our own right now just so we could do this stuff as it just came out. I think eventually we'll probably try and release it, but it's not gonna happen for a while just because teaching people to build thread state service and the, and the uh, the other data set to handle multiple different kinds of data coming in, plus the you know, engineering of web mapping services beyond our typical academic user that we want to that we want to support. So it would take a while for that. Yeah. Uh, then to your last question, the appropriate scale of the model. It's a great question, and to be perfectly honest, we didn't have time uh, in the initial implementation to actually go experiment with that in a lot of ways to say what you know what is the the best resolution for say a, a national implementation of the model. We ended up at 250 meters largely based on computational constraints. What we felt like we could do to produce a high enough resolution of forecast but not have it take too long or present memory challenges as we port the code onto the operational system. And um, I think it's been, it's been very instructive to look at. Uh, this is another depiction here in the background of that surface overland flow field and the river channel network. This is from California. And so when we go to these, the updated version 1.2 with the harmonized DDM, we see a lot of behavior which if you zoom out, it looks okay. You zoom in, it doesn't look good. And that's a classic scale problem. We have that in the meteorological models. We have that in these distributed hydrologic models. I think it's good for, 
you know, if we look at hydrology, it's good for handling ridge versus valley, upland versus lowland transformations. It's not good for very detailed uh, movement of water in very flat areas in particular. We just don't have the resolution necessary to do that. Plus, the idea of what is surface overland flow depth on a 250 by 250 meter grid box is, <laughs> is, I think, pretty abstract. You know, the model would probably say you have five millimeters of water there. And that's a significant amount of water if you look at the volume, but in reality, you'd never see five millimeters of water over here. In grid box, you can see half a meter of water over here, nothing over here just from the way that water moves. So I look at it as more of, you know, we're trying to capture a bulk representation to get the, the gross general movement of water to the streams. And if you look at that specific product, it takes some interpretation to not take too literally, but to say, in this area, there is certainly the potential if you start to get 20, 30 millimeters of water over 250 meter grid box, there's the potential for flooding to happen in that area, but you wouldn't say exactly where and how deep it's going to be. You'd need to go to a hydraulic scale model to do that. In the future, what are they looking at? Um, nothing in the next two years to change the national model resolution. Um, there's this work in hyper resolution modeling, which is always going to be a nest within the, the national modeling framework, and that's where they're going to handle, at least in the short term, uh, you know. Yeah, the vertical flux system. Now we have talked about trying to unify those two grids to go and do everything in 250 meters. So that's a possibility you might see. Not in the next year, but maybe year after that. It, no MP adds a, a significant computation if you go down to 250 meters, but it's, it's still doable. Um, other questions? I, yeah. Um, Zoom, uh, quickly, how, uh, what's the resource savings in that national project? What's the so way? How, how many people? How many people? Well, boy, help me out. We started with about five or six, and we've grown in our group to about eight. Um, not everybody full time all the time because we're matrixed. Um, and then on the water center side, um, there are a couple of technical points of contact, software engineers who we work with on the implementation on the operational system. In terms of the development of the model and the code, all of that was done at NCAR. And now over the past year, there's more people on the NOAA site participating in evaluation and uh, calibration and some of these other activities that are going on. So it is growing rapidly for that first phase of implementation. It was probably about 10 to 12 people. Maybe. Quick, say something about any um, corrections at the end of the day. Yeah, great. Yeah, great question. Um, this is something we'd love to take a deeper dive into, but the National Weather Service, being the National Weather Service, wants to have say on the weather information that goes in more than we do. And so, you know, they we've done uh, we do regridding of the data, obviously, and there's downscaling of certain variables, not of precipitation though, at this point in time. Um, and we've experimented with a couple of different ways to do bias correction, uh, particularly of the precipitation forcings that are coming in. And so for the HER model, there has been some bias correction that was applied in the first two generations, and then it was pulled out. For the GFS model, there is not any bias correction. For the CFS model, there is significant bias correction of all the meteorological fields to map it back to a national scale climatology provided by the NLS data set. So that's more of the traditional sort of HEPEX method of preparing forcing data in ensembles. And, and so that, that's moving forward. We've really, you know, encouraged the close examination of uh, providing bias correction for the shorter range forecast, but those statistics are so noisy they haven't been able to settle on something, uh, particularly across the different forecast lead times. And so what we've seen is, you know, we started with something, got funky results for specific events, and then they pulled it back out. The weather service is still very driven, you know, on an event by event basis, and it's really hard to get them to have confidence in long term statistics. And long term statistical adjustments may mean you make some events worse, but on the aggregate, you're making most events better. They always get wrapped up in that one event that got worse and say, we got to stop doing this because this was worse. And so, right now, unfortunately, for short and medium range forecasts, there's no bias correction for situations. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Here. If I go over, then it's not my fault. <laughs> we're, we're well over, but this is an important discussion.
Um, yeah, we don't. Um, so the reservoir object in the model, which I didn't even get to, is very simple. It's just a level pool scheme that chills uh, as an orifice discharge, which is predefined in advance a set of uh, parameters, and then a spillway overflow recalculation as well. But there's no active management in the National Water Model right now, so that's a big source of uncertainty. And it impacts, you know, we show those bubble blocks and the distribution of bias and correlation. A lot of those metrics come from areas that are below water management infrastructure. And so our forecast and analysis scale is directly impacted by that. We get some recovery from that, at least in the analysis cycle of the model from data simulation. So we'll be assimilating the stream gauge, which is downstream of the reservoir. It obviously corrects for that. But um, it's a huge source of uncertainty on the main stem rivers to not have the water management in there. Um, and again, it's one of those things that we've taken a step back from. We'll provide the infrastructure for water management to get into the data, to get into the model, but we're, NOAA is going to work with the partner agencies in the U.S. and actually building the water management information. So, yeah, tough problem though. I'm just going to go down the line, sorry. <laughs> uh, you said that uh, you took the USGS topographic DM and you modified it to, you know, make your river network, whatever. Is there any feedback then back to USGS? Is there a common um, DM that, that yeah. you guys can agree on? Or um, getting people to agree on stuff is a grand challenge for all of us. So <laughs> no, 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 we haven't done that. But so what we do use, we use the vector network, and we don't alter that unless it's broken. And what we found is that over 2.7 million river reaches, there's some funky stuff in that data set. You have some rivers, you have some channel elements that basically come down, or they come up from a main stem river and they just spiral. And you know, some person who was doing that either didn't care or whatever, their work wasn't being supervised. And you know, there's there's all these things. But that, that's an extreme case of something that's weird in the model. A lot of times what we see is this vector network is supposed to define its flow paths and its divergences and what's the primary flow path and what's the secondary flow path. Or is it just broken? It wasn't connected properly from a topology, topological sense. So we found a lot of those because we're actually tracing water through this and we can see where there's impacts from those. Those kinds of fixes, we've all reported back up to USGS. So they have those fixes and they can continuously update that vectorized data set. The DEM issue is a little bit different because we're the problem child in that sense. There is the national DEM, the NEG, National Elevation Data Set, which is developed in 30 meters. And then we're taking that and regrading it to 250 meters. So USGS doesn't need a 250 meter DEM. We need the 250 meter DEM, and that means it's on us to make that 250 meter DEM as hydrologically consistent with the river channel network. So, yeah, that's available to anyone. Anybody can have that data set, but they don't have a specific need for it besides saying that's the data set that's used in the National Water Okay. You talked before about data simulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said recently you have a simple nudging technique. Yeah, so in the first few versions here, what all that's been done is taking the stream flow data that's coming through this river channel network and nudging the values on that river reach to match the gauge there. It's not quite a direct insert because we're looping that over time and there's some temporal decay and waiting that is associated with that. Um, but it, it, is, it is data simulation in the sense that we then let that propagate downstream and interact with other gauges and things like that. What we're not doing at this present time is updating other model states that are going to help control stream flow production and give the data simulation impact a lot more memory than what's happening right now. So just nudge stream flow, whatever's upstream in the channel network is going to come down in the forecast cycle and so overwhelm we are not propagating upstream. No, there's no upstream localization of the data simulation at this point in time. It's a very difficult problem. Yes. I don't know if you guys have been able to solve it. We, so we're at a yeah. place. <laughs> so we don't have the magic bullet with that. And in fact, probably what we're going to do is we're just going to, we've been told by the water center to basically stop development on this nudging based methodology. And we, we support this as well and move towards a more robust data simulation capability, which is adjusting the terrestrial hydrologic states, which will have a longer term memory impact. So that's what's going on now, and that's why we're going to pull in DART to do that uh, in an ensemble basis, right? Yeah. So I have a question about the 
What terrain resolution? <laughs> it's so it's it's this is this bends people up a little bit. It's it's multiple scales. So there's a one kilometer grid which is handling the column land surface processes, and so you'll get your your soil moisture output, your snowpack output, your ET output on a one kilometer grid. Those get passed to a higher resolution grid, which are handling the routing processes, and that's a 250 meter grid. So you'll get a set of outputs from the water model, such as that surface water depth and the depth to saturation in the soils because the, the, the groundwater flow representation that's in there right now, which comes out on a 250 meter grid. So there's there's multiple grids that are going on. There's not one resolution in the model, there's multiple resolutions. So would that need to be used, reuse a different database to create the database? Oh, good question. The one kilometer column land surface model itself it doesn't have any specific need for elevation information, but you can regrid that from 30 meter any data set. Um, really, the, the source data for elevation for all of this is the 30 meter any data set, and then we aggregate that up. So. Okay, and then um, the next question is that the Bayer Bayer GIS-based um, uh, web mapping service, and you know ultimately there's a lot of really nice functionality and capabilities that come with that in terms of doing spatial queries and things like that on the fly, and developing a lot of products. Um, for us, again, when we were going into the pre-operational testing phase, you know, like, we raised a question: It's like, what are you guys going to use to look at this and show the management at the weather service? That producing anything. And uh, they said, well, we've got this enterprise GIS solution. We're like, great, <coughs> can we see some of the output so we can learn from the model? Like, oh, well, it's not ready yet. We're just starting. So we're like, so nobody's looking at this. <laughs> we went through this like, oh, OK. So we had been working on this tool for other applications. And we just said, OK, well, here's what we've got to do. We've got to be able to see what's coming out of the model. And it's got to be more than a static image of forecast, right? Just a PMG or something like that. We need to be able to interact with the data. And so that's why we went to this particular tool, because we knew we could provide sort of on-the-fly examination <laughs> probing of the data for the web mapping service. We've offered that to the weather service. They want to stick with their enterprise solution, so they don't use our tool uh, externally, but they have started using it internally. <coughs> so the people that we work with on the water model development side, when they need information on the fly, like they did for uh, a lot of the things with Hurricane Harvey um, and Irma to a certain extent, they'll they'll get on our tool and create graphics and things like that to see what's going on in the model. What you can get on the web right now from the weather service is largely you can look at stream flow on the very recent forecast. Um, they don't go back very far in time. You can't get your stream flow forecast for that given cycle. Um, and I think they now overlay an observation in some locations. That's about it. The gridded products are all just static images. And that, that a software, the web software is, is a part of the web property release. What's that? Is that, that toolkit is a part of the No, that was, that was Alfonso's oh. question. So yeah, we can't. We just can't support it for the community now. It's a lot more involved. Um, so, well, maybe in the, the future we can release it, but we can't do it right now. We just don't have any basis to support it. Yeah. I think we should stop there. Okay. I know I don't have a lot of questions, but let's um, save that for the discussion. Um, so, and Audrey are going to um, talk about the integration of that work with our systems with the Uh, we've also been asked to help coordinate on the 
transfers to the airport. So um, what we're going to do is put up a list here. You can come add the times of your flights, um, whether it's today or tomorrow, just as the, as the workshop goes along today. So let's say Wednesday and Thursday, do you want to put your flight time and your name next to the flight time? And then you all can organize yourselves for transfers and uh, taxis to the airport. Okay, good morning. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about our recent effort uh, to partnership with uh, uh, NASA and CAR, and also NOAA, to uh, put together this uh, co-ends uh, land surface and the uh, hydrology uh, new capability into our couple model system. And that will show some preliminary results. So this project is still ongoing. So we're still working on several different technical issues to have for the system uh, the fully functioning two way. And uh, here's the list of the, the expert teams uh, that we assemble. And uh, Aubrey and the Dave uh, are in charge of the uh, integration of the uh, warp hydro system into Cohen's. And we have also the NASA team uh, was uh, uh, working on the list system. And the NOAA team, uh, they are the, uh, the land original uh, land surface model, NOAA land surface model uh, developers. And uh, we also have the Army, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineering uh, John Allender. So, so this is this is a truly uh, kind of community effort that we try to uh, going on here. And the sponsor is actually is the uh, Office of Naval Research. They manage the National Oceanographic Partnership Program in the U.S. So that make it all happen uh, was this uh, uh, integration. So the objective of here uh, is basically is just to create a new baseline capability uh, for uh, U.S. Uh, um, uh, Navy's model coins. This is a regional model, and uh, so for today, I'm gonna uh, kind of briefly describe the coupling components. So yesterday I uh, talked about the uh, the other components coupled in the couple system. So we're going to focus on just specific with the land surface model and hydrology uh, today. And I'm going to show uh, some uh, preliminary results with our test case. This is actually a Hurricane Irene case that we're using. And uh, uh, then we're going to talk about what's our future plan. So before I reach the summary, I'm going to have Aubrey come up and then uh, discuss uh, some of the, her effort in doing this preliminary evaluation of what comes out of this couple system. And uh, so this is a kind of introduction of uh, the NASA list uh, land information system. So as you can see, what uh, this information system is uh, including the data simulation of uh, a lot of uh, uh, land surface um, information. And uh, nice things about this system is that it contains uh, multiple options. So it's very easy to switch from using a different soil model. So we think that this system itself, you can configure the list, you can run the land surface model uh, ensemble uh, using the different land surface model. So right now they have all the different versions of the NOAA model inside. And they are in the process of putting the European analysis model jewels in there. And uh, they have the NOAA model, also the, uh, called the ROC model in there. And this software is also a public uh, release software, so you can download from the inside. They recently uh, released their uh, 7.2 version. And uh, however, the 7.2 version doesn't contain all this. ESMF uh, cap 
that currently uh, has been finished under our project, uh, but they are in the process of that integrating that into their next release. Uh, so basically, this is the uh, Poens um, system uh, that integrated lives in the warp hydro. So you heard about uh, uh, Davis talked about the national water uh, model. So basically, it's very similar. So we use this, the same configuration as the national water model uh, for the warp hydro implementation in Poens. And so instead of uh, uh, using um, the NOAA model, so in this case, we're using the Cohen's atmospheric force uh, from, to, for the list. And then the, uh, right now, we are doing the two-way coupling between the list and the warp hydro. And uh, for the coupling between the Cohen's atmosphere model with the warp hydro, uh, right now, it's not implemented. So. We are relying on all this information between the list and the wolf hydro, and then the, for the list and feedback all the solar state back to the atmospheric model. Uh, but uh, Dave and I will uh, have talked about it maybe in the future that we will look at the direct coupling uh, between the uh, wolf hydro and the atmospheric model. So this is, a, you see this uh, big uh, complex diagram. Uh, so Right now, this is what uh, this piece of the coupling system is. So, uh, following this talk, Sherry is going to talk about uh, her effort uh, to couple the ocean model with the wolf hydro. And so, this, there's actually will be a two way uh, interaction kind of between the ocean and the wolf hydro system. That's not showing in this overall diagram of the poets. So we're hoping that by the time with both Sharon's effort and, and this, this effort here, that uh, we'll be able to have uh, complete the couple system uh, within the Collins framework and uh, that including uh, all the uh, integration, uh, have a, a consistent integration for all the way from the land atmosphere uh, over to the ocean and then and then be able to handle the uh, importance of the coastal uh, forecast for both the meteorology and the ocean. And so uh, now in terms of the, the detail of the coupling, and so right now the atmospheric models provide all this forcing to the list system. And then between the list and the warp hydro, the list is actually uh, pass which is the soil temperature and moisture information to wolf hydro and the wolf hydro operate that and then feed back to the list system and uh, so including these uh, surface runoff and uh, so then there's no coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean uh, and the wolf hydro right And so this is kind of a, a cartoon depiction of the, the system right now. So this part of work is done uh, by the ESMF team. And so through this uh, uh, project, because the Nicolas atmosphere is a, a master grid model, and then the master grid model need to be integrated with the land surface model every time step, every time to be iteration. So that create a challenge for the current ESMF framework uh, because uh, in the past, uh, all those control is at the top level. So basically you don't go down to the model. Uh, but because you have to pass the NAS information at every time iteration back to the list system. So that means that all the information need to kind of bubble up to the top of the ESMF for infrastructure at the uh, NAS uh, iteration time step. So in order to handle that, um, so the ESMF team uh, developed this NAS to NAS uh, coupling uh, connector, and which is not currently uh, uh, supported under the new OPSI uh, framework. And so if you <coughs> download the 
uh, ESMF and UOPC, uh, this capability is not there. Uh, but they are uh, hoping that, you know, by the completion of this project in the future, they will be able to provide this uh, capability to the uh, community. And so uh, this is slide that shows the test case for Hurricane Irene. Uh, we have uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, zoom in the nest grid. The inner nest is a street parameter. Uh, however, the COEMS configuration uh, for the uh, TC model uh, right now is uh, the inner tube nest is automatic follow the model forecast hurricane track. Um, but however, to simplify the the uh, the model configuration for this particular development work, we decided we're just going to do a fixed fixed grid. And so this is a, a three day simulation. Um, so and the, basically the hurricane is uh, kind of uh, uh, going through the east coast and it created a flood uh, in the eastern seaboard of the United States. So what I'm going to show, going to show is some, uh, uh, this is the movie animation. So when we started the project, uh, we started with a couple models. So we want to establish some baseline. When we finish the, the coupling, we can compare with. So uh, this is the test, actually, uh, the listing Sujia Kumar. He provided us the two different the initial conditions from list uh, using the different techniques. So that you can see it, that label, the list of the LDT. So basically, it's kind of a different way of uh, spin up the list <coughs> model. And the spin up, uh, it's like seven years spin up. So this is so using those two different data set, we did a kind of a, uh, initial uh, evaluation uh, with the uh, COAS uh, simulation of the uh, the hurricane Irene. And, uh, so this is uh, this slide that shows the ten centimeters soil moisture uh, differences. So you can see that. Uh, was the two different data sets actually have quite a bit of different um, uh, forecasts, you know, uh, for the soil, the top soil uh, moisture, especially uh, over the, uh, the rocky, US rocky area. And uh, so you can see that the, uh, it's, uh, the model is quite sens sensitive to the initialization, uh, soil moisture initialization. Here's the uh, comparison of the soil temperature. And the soil, especially the top level soil temperature affect the atmospheric forecast of the surface uh, two meter uh, temperature uh, it's, uh, and the moisture. And so again, same thing, you see that the, it's very sensitive to the initial condition. So uh, to do me, we're, we're gonna look at the specific at the two sites. Uh, this is in from the, uh, the, the station uh, data, and uh, the, the site is kind of indicating those of uh, the white box there, um, right here. And uh, so we did the traditional coens uh, uh, evaluation of our surface parameter. <coughs> um, so this is the uh, parameter that we routinely uh, use uh, for the operational model also, that we look at the temperature, dew point, uh, sea level pressure, relative humidity, and the wind direction and speed. And uh, so in addition to that, we also look at the uh, upper air parameters. This is this comparison with the rayop stations uh, so basically, we do the bias and the uh, looming square comparison. And uh, so this is just compared that. So as yes, you can see that in the, especially in the lower boundary layer, you know, using this two data set that give you a different uh, bias uh, and the RMS uh, uh, characteristic. Um, so um, this slide, um, shows that the uh, soil moisture difference between the two. And uh, 
This is the soil moisture. And um, this is size is just, uh, I think it's a UP. Okay, this is a different level. And so at the stations, so we do this uh, station comparisons. And uh, uh, again, uh, the model data is interpolated to the station location and the entire water in New Jersey. And you can see that the, uh, the model during the model speed up time, uh, this is the most of the differences we see uh, in the, uh, the two data set. Uh, but however, you also have a big difference in the uh, end of our simulation time uh, when the Hurricane Irene is kind of passing through to the north side of the uh, eastern United States. So same behavior for the temperature. And uh, so this is kind of new. So with that baseline established, we, uh, we do this in step um, in, in our development cycle. The first thing we did is do with the one-way couple with the three uh, models and uh, see whether we get some behavior. So this results from the one-way coupling and uh, this slides uh, movie shows that this is the soil uh, moisture, the top level. And uh, um, so you look at down to the uh, 20 meter, 40 meter, and 100 meter, and you can kind of visualize, uh, kind of see that there's nothing uh, wrong, weird going on. So that means that the implementation of the coupling is done uh, correctly, at least for the one-way system. And so this is the same thing shows that there was a soil temperature. And again, you have the diurnal cycle, you can see. So the model is behaving as it's supposed to be. And um, so to evaluate the wolf hydro, uh, again, uh, we first just examine the surface runoff. So this shows the surface runoff. I forgot to mention that the, uh, the line here that shows the, the black one is uh, actually the uh, observation of, of the <coughs> track. The red one is the model forecast track. So they are uh, fairly close. So that gives us a, a good confidence about what we've seen here. Then we can compare to the real station observation of, 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 of from a hydrograph station and surface station. And uh, here's the surface runoff, subsurface runoff. So you can see that the, the color does change. And so um, there's a several hot spots uh, kind of uh, uh, indicated here. And then those, uh, uh, and Aubrey is going to come up to, uh, to show some result that she did the more detailed evaluation of this, uh, uh, the, this preliminary results. So this is just, um, you know, we've been, as you mentioned, we've been spending a lot of time. Play the room. Um, oh, yeah, I played the room. We've been working on uh, basically the engineering of the coupling to date. And so uh, at this point, the runs that I've been doing have just been offline. As to sort of establish a benchmark for what our performance will be once we get a fully coupled system. So this run is actually from an NLDAS 2 driven run. And this is accumulated preset. I'm sorry, I don't really have the state's outline, but from the images that Sue showed you earlier, you can kind of see that trajectory of the um, accumulated precipitation across the event. And then on the right is that surface inundation that Dave showed earlier. And so it's just to kind of show that tracking of where the actual flooding might have occurred. And this is something that we'll be able to evaluate against um, remote sensing. And then, um, you know, since Sue was kind enough to come on this talk, and as a card carrying hydrologist, I have to show hydrographs. So these are our initial evaluations. We picked a series of USGS stations across the event. And Again, just to establish the benchmark, this is basically out of the box um, work hydro, but then I did want to touch on the uh, calibration. <coughs> Dave mentioned the calibration we did for the national water model. So, what I did was just actually take two parameters um, that I knew would be sensitive 
in this region and pull those values from our elevation that we do have the National Water Model. We'll just put those in here. And as you'll actually see in the northern part of the domain, which are these, um, this first two rows here, you can see actually we're doing a pretty good job of doing those head graph keys. As we start to move down south into the domain, which is actually a different set of parameters that I didn't put in there, you'll see that we start to degrade the performance. So um, this is just an experiment with some of that parameter, that parameter transferability. Um, and I will say, Maddie, since you made this comment yesterday, that we did do some parameter sensitivity as part of the National Water Model calibration. So we're in the process of actually doing a little bit more rigorous um, full set of parameter sensitivity uh, for our next iteration. So we will be publishing that. So we'll have some sense of sort of the range of parameter sensitivity, at least across the Colonus domain, which is a decent distribution of um, hydrologic responses. So uh, some of that came into play here, but we'll, we'll have a robust analysis. So I can ask a question. Do you have an idea on how many parameters are independent? Are independent, meaning that they are the ones that changing them, you might have a derived a good effect on the others. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we have a great idea of that at this exact moment, because the initial parameter sensitivity that we did was just varying the parameters independently and seeing impacts on the hydrograph response. We for this next version that we're doing, that we're working on the next five months, we'll be doing actually a more robust full sensitivity analysis with the interactions between the parameters. So I think we'll have a better sense of that once we come out of those next couple months of analysis. Okay, so this is just our summary. Uh, so right now we are. The two-way coupling between the list and the work has been implemented. Uh, however, we are still working on the last technical issues about uh, removing the water into the channel. And uh, uh, so there's something that uh, seems not quite right. So uh, we hope we will uh, kind of uh, go through that hurdle in the next few months. And uh, the other thing is uh, that's still remaining uh, for the development work in terms of the coupling is that the uh, right now the uh, we still running the system in the uh, the course domain time step. Uh, we want to be driven uh, for the NAS using the finer iteration time step, and then uh, to complete that task. And then uh, for the remaining of the project that we uh, the team is going to devote more time in. To, uh, the validation and the test of the replicability of the COEN system. And so we run the COENs in operation actually is over hundreds of, of area over the globe. And so relocatability is very important for us. And uh, as Dave and both Dave and Aubrey has shown that when you move the world hydro um, to other region of the world, uh, you need to recalibrate. And so we are testing uh, uh, the second case, which is over by the Philippines, uh, Luzon area. And we have a collaboration with Pagasa and also the uh, University of the Philippines uh, there. So and, uh, we, we will uh, use the Philippine, Philippine case to test that how much uh, additional work that we need for the Wolf Hydro to be able to kind of move around to different regions. And uh, the expected growth impact, uh, we really want to be able to uh, provide this new capability of high resolution forecasts similar to uh, what the National Water <coughs> Center, but not over the US. And uh, especially for uh, the Navy Riverine operation or the coastal operation. Um, this type of capability is uh, very important. And um, so uh, future plan, um, we are continue, we will continue working with our partner to refine all those coupling parameters. And uh, uh, then we want to kind of evaluate and make sure our water cycle within this couple system is a concern. And, um, and with that, that's all I have. Thank you. Questions for Steve? 
we we talk about that uh, this yesterday. Uh, since uh, comms is a uh, product of the Navy, mm -hmm. something not fully delivered uh, that can be delivered completely. Mm -hmm. What can we expect about future availability of this system or uh, or parts of the system? Yeah. So. Uh so this system, when, as we finish this project, we're going. To, this is going to the last year of the project. So after that, you you can see from Dave's talks that in order to reach the operational level, there's a lot of other things going around. That means they need to have something with the web's GUI interface to help them to complete. And so for the current Poland system, we actually have some such things called the Poland OS uh, that help the operation model to have a configured model system. But this new system also needs additional things. And that's the, uh, the, the you know, geo, geos, uh, geographic and, and, this, and then also the map overlay things and capability that they, they've screwed past. Uh, so that means that, that part of the things that we still need to work with our operational partner because uh, they have a different requirement because of this, you know, the security, you have to make sure that the, uh, any web services uh, is a very secure pass through their security uh, uh, regulations because all this um, kind of internet attack is also a big concern. And uh, so that part is need to still need to be kind of uh, uh, refined with operational partner. And um, also, uh, you know, you see the from Dave's talk and also the sensitivity from our initial test that the LENSIFS model, both LENSIFS model and um, Roth Hydro, you need to train the model before you start. So that part of software we're not dealing with in this project. So that means that we still need to work on that part. And so in, in terms of the future of the Navy system, uh, that means that uh, until we work out that piece, you know, uh, we won't be able to, to transition this capability to operation to run 24-7. But in terms of the open source component, so one of the contributions to the open source community is the ESMF Wapsi compliant connectors. Right? So through this uh, uh, this project, that both the Wapsi cap for Wap Hydrogen and this will be available for the community. Uh, for the whole MC itself, it is not. So basically, right now, that the way that NRL. Uh, partner or collaborate with outside community is through uh, the MOA. So it's kind of legal binding uh, agreement between uh, uh, NRL and, and any institution. And so usually uh, that has to go through, unfortunately, quite long, between six months to a year to get it done. And, uh, and if, uh, and also, uh, all of us of naval researchers really like, uh, you know, uh, engaging with the community. So they are fully supported to that. And um, so it's just done case by case basis. So there's a way for international partners to collaborate um, and be part of this through those mechanisms. And you can talk to Stu about that afterwards. I think we should move on. To Cheryl Ann. Thanks so much. Thanks, um, Audrey and Sue, for sharing a first look at this test case um, with us. Cheryl Yep. Uh, so I have the, um, as Sue said, the connection of getting the fresh water to the ocean. So ONR had this huge project, but they left out the ocean. So I, I got the. <laughs> I said, hey. <laughs> uh, so I, this is done with uh, myself. I'm at the Ocean Arctic Division of Naval Research Laboratory. It's at Stennis Space Center. Uh, my collaborator, Song Yang, is at um, in Monterey, California at NRL. He's working on the precipitation. We're doing it from remote sensing. I'll show you that. Um, Aubrey's uh, been receiving lots of emails from me and been kind enough to, to respond. Um, we're trying to. Uh, 
you know, in trying to understand Wolf Hydro and how that comes into our project and uh, several other NRL collaborators. Um, so basically, I just want to go back to what Nadia said yesterday, how we've got the fresh water. Uh, coincidentally, this is a, an example from Puerto Rico. They have a shallow, um, a narrow shelf here, and you can see that the precipitation events and stuff coming out this river channel, and it's not confined to the near shore, it's moving offshore and out into the deeper ocean. Same thing off here on the coast of Florida. This is uh, inland rivers dumping water um, into the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida. This is about 200 kilometers out into the uh, ocean. And then uh, on a different day, a Hurricane Irene passed and nothing's not much is happening on the west coast, but on the east coast, you can see that freshwater signature again. So the bottom line is that uh, the freshwater is moving from the land into the ocean and offshore out of the coastal water into the shelf water. And it's, whoops, I think this works. Cool. Um, it's a multi-scale processes. That, that's uh, a key issue. So, um, in a lot of my work before, some of you have seen me, um, I uh, have done a lot of finite element modeling, and in the last five years I've done some very sophisticated models of river systems, braided river systems, where we link uh, upstream with um, sort of these lump hydrology models, way upstream of the river and push the water downstream through um, the hydrodynamics that are being modeled by the finite element model. The problem with that is like Nadia showed yesterday, she had a different approach where she attached her estuarine box model. You have to do that for each river and each uh, river reach and have a hydrologic model up the end, um, upstream for each of that. And so um, that's lovely for, you know, um, the work I did in St. Tammany Paris, Louisiana, where they're really interested in the Pearl River and flooding locally and so on. But the Navy is interested in this uh, global relocatable capability. That's what Sue talked about. And so it's just really not practical to go in and put in these very detailed models of rivers all around the world because uh, mostly we actually don't have the information. We're typically data deprived. In the areas that the Navy is interested in, we do not have stream flow gauges, we do not have detailed uh, bathymetries of the rivers and so on. So you have to have um, a different approach. And the thing is that the fresh water in the ocean affects, from the Navy point of view, affects propulsion systems, glider deployments, acoustic propagation, and I can go on and on. So currently what's done, um, and it kind of, this kind of fits into this operational session, is that the operational coastal ocean model Access is a global river database. It's con uh, constructed with monthly mean discharges, and it's on a fixed grid of course resolution, like an eighth degree. And it really doesn't include any rainfall or runoff events. Okay, so that, that that's a problem. So just looking here at Chesapeake Bay, this is um, a simulation of a snapshot um, from July of 2013 of Chesapeake Bay. This is the salinity, and this is extremely high. So this is supposed to be fresh, and this is on the order of 30.4 parts per thousand. And then this is the salinity, which is on the order of 32.8. This is just a climatological snapshot of the bay, and we're literally twice as high in salinity with these, uh, this global mean um, database. So that's not going to work. Um, so how are we going to solve this problem? Basically, uh, the idea is to couple in um, the hydrology to the ocean model. And so Sue's project is taking care of um, this land surface modeling. This is the interaction between the land and the atmosphere. Uh, my project is not dealing with that. We're just looking at the overland flow and the river runoff and then moving that into the ocean. So this is uh, in a sort of a schematic. This is um, Sue's problem, uh, where they've got the coamps, the atmosphere, coupling into the LIS um, land surf in the NOAA and the land surface model, and then pushing that um, soil moisture and, and surface temperature to the wharf hydro for the river routing and overland flow. So what I'm adding is this full two-way coupling between the wharf hydro and the coastal ocean. And something I'm, I'm not going to talk about today is that I'm also looking at advanced um, coupling or nesting between the coastal and the regional scale model. Because as we 
push the coastal model inland to interface with the hydrology model, then the regional models are going to move inland, but they're going to move into areas where you've got these freshwater pollutants coming out, and it's you have to um, you have to conserve quantities at that interface um, and have a much more sophisticated uh, multi-scale type coupling. So the project uh, half the project is involved with that, and the first half is related to this uh, coupling with Wharf Hydro, which is what I'm talking about today. So um, this is my system that I'm um, dealing with. Uh, we're using Cohen strictly for the atmospheric forcing, the winds and the surface fluxes to the coastal ocean model. We're using satellite derived precipitation uh, as input to the Wharf Hydro. And then as far as I understand it right now, um, we need basically soil moisture, land cover, land use data, and the topography going into more fiber. So, um, let's see. So the reason why we went with the satellite-based precipitation is that we can we feel like uh, we can get a little bit more accurate precipitation estimates right now than going through the um, atmospheric model. It's just a whole other layer of complication honestly, um, that we don't need. We can also get some efficiency um, using an external source of rainfall. We don't actually have to calculate using the atmospheric model. And then there's some flexibility because we can evaluate the effects of rainfall latency and the resolution of that precipitation on freshwater getting into the ocean. So our goal is to uh, look at the freshwater movement in the ocean and maybe what effect, uh, you know, how accurate a precipitation do we have to have in order to get that signal into the ocean? Um, that's, that's one of the questions. So we're starting off with this uh, Japanese GS map uh, satellite data. It's hourly, it's uh, a 10th degree resolution. It's taking a blended uh, passive microwave um, data and blending it with IR sensors. The passive microwave tends to be more accurate, but coarser, and the IR has more resolution, but isn't quite as accurate. So the uh, way that they blend those two pieces of information, add in if there's any surface range gauge measurements, and come up with this um, GS map product. As we move through the project, we hope to move to the NASA GPM precipitation. It's uh, similar, but basically the passive microwave satellites are going to be used to, they're the more accurate ones, to sort of train the IR data, which is much higher resolution. Um, and that's a, a, called an iMERGE uh, product and uh, should be available um, in the next year or so. Um, we'll move to that. So um, you see these slides, we pulled them from the NCAR um, description of Wharf Hydro, but this is my focus, is basically I'm using the terrain routing models for overland flow, um, and then the channel routing. Um, this just shows the output, we've seen this, um, and the advantages to using the Wharf Hydro is that it's multi-scale, multi-resolution, and it's portable and scalable across multiple platforms. Um, so, let's see, um, so the, the ocean model is the Navy Coastal Ocean Model. It's a, a flexible variant of the Princeton Ocean Model. It has a number of options for a vertical coordinate. It includes sigma. Uh, you can have a mixture of sigma and Z levels. Um, there's a generalized sigma coordinate now, and it can have different mixings, uh, of course, different boundary conditions. It handles all the standard forcing from the atmosphere, tides, rivers, winds, surface fluxes. Um, it does uh, fit within this COAMP model coupling architecture. It's ESMF compliant so that we can um, plug it into the, the coupling and exchanging variables with both uh, COAMPs and Wharf Hydro, et cetera. And it does have uh, wetting and drying. So, um, so we're leveraging kind of what Sue's project is ending, mine is beginning. Um, so we're going to take their test case, Hurricane Irene. Um, this just shows you the path, and it ends up here in um, Chesapeake Bay is right here. Um, that's a, a test case that we've used a lot uh, with the Navy Coastal Ocean Model. So we're, we're starting with that. This is the accumulated precipitation, and these are just examples of storm surge values in feet up and down this uh, area with our focus is on Chesapeake Bay. So this is the satellite precipitation from the GS map uh, that we've processed for uh, the Hurricane Irene period. This is just a snapshot of August 28th. 
Um, we basically have uh, processed, um, I think, April through uh, September of this uh, rainfall. And this is just a zoom in of the Chesapeake Bay area. We've done some air analyses on the precipitation. Um, there's correlation, bias, RMS, ratio. This is the GS map rainfall, and we're comparing against the NOAA stage four hourly rainfall. You'll notice a high bias in this area. This is where um, there is no NOAA stage four data in that area, so you can just kind of ignore this box down here. Um, we basically downscaled this NOAA stage four hourly rainfall from four kilometers to 10 kilometers, which is the resolution of this GS map data. Um, we're looking at, uh, I'm spoke, we're looking at June to August, and then the error is on the order of about 5%, less than 5%. So that's uh, decent. Uh, this is uh, Wharf Hydro. This is courtesy of Aubrey. Um, this is their Irene domain. Uh, we're interested in trying to get a cutout of Chesapeake Bay. This, this is the, um, the flood basins associated with Chesapeake Bay. And um, let's see, uh, these, this is just, I extracted those stations which Aubrey showed um, for the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, and this is for the period of July through September 2011. And as you said, they're basically uncalibrated, this is the ones I pulled. So this is the Navy Coastal Ocean model. We've set it up for um, Chesapeake Bay. This is uh, our, the operational, it's called the U.S. East Domain. Um, it's larger, obviously. Uh, we're using it for our initial and bad conditions. Uh, as Nadia said, they call it nested. But, um, so this is our actual domain, and this is um, what we're using for boundary conditions. So here's the Chesapeake Bay uh, domain. It's 500 meter resolution with 50 vertical levels. Um, we're using the uh, NOAA Coastal Relief Map, which is um, three arc second, about 90 meters uh, in the uh, bathymetry. Okay, so here's the, uh, um, I'm not sure how to do it. I have a, a movie of the salinity. Uh, this is from April uh, through September 2011. We have six of the monthly uh, mean rivers that are forcing this model. We're using co-amps, um, uh, 0.2 degree resolution for the winds. Oops. Sorry. Um, It's just uh, uh, showing the uh, salinity, um, the map of salinity. You can see you can see the tidal pulsing, and that this plume comes out uh, onto the shelf and moves down uh, the coast here at different times depending on the wind. There's often uh, frontal passages in this area that are on the time scales of hours. Um, so we're looking to get higher resolution uh, winds. Um, in this area. So this is just like a preliminary simulation setting up things as they are now with that monthly uh, river database. So as a so as a, some preliminary experiments, um, we want to do this just an offline one-way coupling um, where we exchange stream flow. So initially we're, we have this run where we used our monthly mean discharges. We're also setting up the model for these same rivers with the USGS um, river discharges that are hourly. And then the third um, simulation, initially, we want to take that Chesapeake Bay cutout from Wharf Hydro and take the stream flow at these same um, locations and force the model. And just look at that as a, an initial comparison. But ultimately, what we want to do is develop a two-way um, coupling module that will exchange information between the Wharf Hydro hydrology model and the Navy Coastal Ocean model. So there's a number of challenges in um, how to develop the coupler and sort of basically what the physics are that are in it. Uh, one of those is the placement of the, the boundary, basically where you're going to put that interface between the hydrology model and the uh, ocean model. And 
not only what is the optimal location, but what kind of resolution. So how far do we need to take the ocean model into the land sea interface and where should we bring the hydrology model in? So Dave showed you some inundation um, from just the, the river network that they were doing in the hydrology model. But what that didn't include is um, any tidal uh, influence coming into the land margin or any surge influence that could block the rivers and affect flooding inland or whatever. So um, that's the one thing that, that I'm showing schematically here. We've got tides coming in, surge coming in, and then you've got um, the hydrology model that in theory we could have a sort of a distributed flux. We're taking not just the stream flows, but um, overland flow and applying it along the boundary of the ocean model. So there's, there's some questions there. Like I say, I think we'll probably go through, um, you know, a number of uh, boundary placements and, you know, see what works best in different situations. Um, but our idea is to make a coupler that is um, sort of portable in the sense that it's going to be taking in the fields from the hydrology model, the, the water levels, uh, water flux, temperature, and, and the ocean model is going to be sending its water levels um, temperatures, et cetera, velocities, and um, all of the exchange and stuff is going to be happening in the coupler. So that if, if we later decide to change the ocean model or the hydrology model, then we don't really lose um, basically the physics and things that we put into the coupler. Um, so, but there's other questions too, as far as the timing. Um, these models typically run, I think, at similar time steps, but uh, coupling at that time step level is going to be very, very expensive and probably not what we want to do. So is it the kind of thing where we want to accumulate water over some kind of event scale? You know, how do we determine when there's an event? Um, you know, it's just lots of questions in the, in the temple realm as well as how to do that coupler. So this is just summarizing. Um, basically, we're just getting started. Um, we've got some preliminary experiments to, to basically start hooking up um, all these are satellite-based precipitation, our ocean model, our hydrology model, and then we need to investigate basically that location of that exchange interface, uh, the temporal frequency of the exchange. There's, of course, there's inconsistencies between the topography and the bathymetry in the, mo in the ocean model and in the hydrology model, um, so we need to reconcile those, and there's probably differences also with the atmospheric model. Um, and then in a conversation I had with Aubrey, I realized that the hydrology model is not handling any wind over the land, but in terms of the ocean model and surge and things like that, we have wind over land, so how are we going to reconcile that? Um, and then the big question for our applications is really also what's the availability of databases uh, that are global and high resolution for soil moisture and whatever else is needed for the hydrology model. So these are just some unresolved questions, issues. There. So that's where I'm at. Okay. Is one hydro able to handle like a basalt land if you were to give it that? Oh, again, the Aubrey question. <laughs> Um, I, I think it can handle backflow, uh, but I don't know. If it, I don't think it has to say salt in hydrology. Right, right. They can handle actual flow upstream, I mean, going backflow, but not the um, density. Yeah, so um, a lot of questions there. There's options. So. In the national water model, in that implementation, we're using less cleanup carbon. We have instances of the model options switch physics that we can run. That's a I just want to apologize really for your talk. I had a phone call and I couldn't. Uh, this is amazing, but just to ask you, <laughs> just to ask you a um, question. So you have a very high resolution um, NCOM model inside the river, right? And then you get the eyebrow input. Uh, 
Uh, right, well, actually, the way we're doing it right now is we just lay down a high resolution regular grid of exactly. the income model. So it, it's covering um, the bay and the river as, as far as we determine that you exactly. want to go. And so right now, the, the model is 500 meter resolution, but my target resolution on the initial slides was we're looking really at 10 to 100 meters for the ocean model. Um, and so like I said, that's really the question is how far inland do we need to go? And then that in turn pulls the regional model in further. So we need advanced. Uh, when the salinity is zero, you have to go and then get the idea for the rest, right? Because right. your model can do the salt. Right, right, right. So that, that's definitely um, a consideration for sure. Um, and like I said, there's also something that I hadn't thought about before is we need to allow wind over the land in terms of the surge and that sort of thing, which the hydrology model is not going to handle um, right now. So, so we may need to go more inland than we originally thought. Okay. So, uh, anyway, yes. Yeah. So, how important is it considering most of those? I mean, you already have a key for the water level, right? Beyond the water. So, how important is it for you? Uh, well, it, it, it goes back to something someone said yesterday about what is the purpose of your model. So, um, and it and it varies. Uh, that's sort of um, the conundrum, I guess you will. We're trying to get a capability that that can go global and we can lay down anywhere, but we often have different purposes. And sometimes it is, um, you know, there's a typhoon. <laughs> that the Navy is interested in, in either figuring out where it's going to go, what it's going to do, moving assets, or actually determining the impact on adversaries. Uh, so there could be a case where they are interested in actually knowing um, sort of the inundation aspect overland, and not just in the ocean. Um, but other times, um, it's sufficient just to get accurate fresh water you know, at that coastal boundary. Um, it depends. I mean, but there are other times when there's people being inserted and going up a river, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, in the long term, uh, like Nadia said, I think there's going to be in the future down the road, they will have to have another layer of models where you maybe go to the unstructured grid models if you need to go up the river or, or whatever. But right now, they're, they're not considering that for operations. Um, so. Other questions? Okay, great. Thank you. We are actually going to take a break right now. We're going to do the photo right now out there on the terrace. And we will come back at 11.20. There is the break room has refreshments up where we were on those couple of steps. Um, make sure if you want to participate in the ride share into the airport, enter your information on the board. But please, let's all head outside right now. And we'll continue with the Because the people are like,